Is Morgan Scally one of the best defensive coordinators in college football? We're talking about it on today's Locked On Utes. You are Locked On Utes, your daily podcast on the Utah Utes. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and thank you for making Locked On Utes your first listen every single day. We are available on all platforms, including YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is JT Wister, so former intern inside the University of Utah Athletic Department. If this is your first time you're listening to our show, make sure you guys like and subscribe. We'd love to interact with you guys in the comments or on social media. You can follow our show at Locked On Utes or my personal handle at JT Wister. So on today's show, we're talking all things Morgan Scally, and we will close a little Utah men's basketball recruiting thing because they did use their final roster spot. So we'll talk about the addition of the team. But first, to help us break down all things revolving Morgan Scally. It's Dante Guardi of Ute Zone. And Dante, when you're talking about Morgan Scally, I do believe he's a guy who we'll talk about where he ranks kind of in a little bit. I do believe he belongs in the top 10 of defensive coordinators in college football. I think there's a lot of worthy defensive coordinators in college football, but I just really like what Morgan Scally brings to the game. I mean, if I remember correctly, Dante, this is a guy who more Urban Meyer, which we I'm glad that Morgan Scally decided to stay at Utah because it would have been a disaster. <laughs> and uh, just like it was for the Jacksonville Jaguars, he wanted Morgan Scally to join him and be his DC in the NFL. I believe that's just how respected a guy of Morgan Scally's caliber is. I think he's an exceptional defensive play caller. We could talk about some of the specific things he does that I really like in a second but I mean this is a Utah defense on under Scali has led the Pac-12 five times in seven of his seasons as defensive coordinator rushing defenses 16 18 19 20 and 21 and they ranked third in the nation in 2019 and fifth in 2018 in those categories as well so they just play the game the right way really stout defense that's what Utah's identity is you're going to run the football and you're going to get good defense it's why they're one of the most respected teams in college football by opposing coaches and some of the top media analysts overall and Scally is a huge part of what has made this recent dynasty now that they're back-to-back Pac-12 champions so formidable yeah and you look at some of the players that Scally's coached you know he's more of a more of a secondary coach, was a safety mm-hmm. at Utah and uh, kind of honed in on that position group throughout his time. And you look at some of the safeties that he's coached at Utah. Marcus Williams, now one of the best safeties in the NFL, got that huge contract last offseason from uh, the Baltimore Ravens. You got Chase Hansen, who came, in, came into Utah as a quarterback and then went to linebacker, or, but then went to safety, balled out, then went to linebacker. So, I mean, just being able to coach, the, coach these players and um, put them in the best position to succeed and kind of – thinking outside the box and using these players in ways that other coaches wouldn't really think that and putting them in positions to simply succeed. Like I said, you know, Chase Hansen was a quarterback coming into Utah. Morgan Scali turns him into a safety. And then from there, it's just, just cake. You know, he was one of the best players in the PAC 12 for a few seasons. You also look at Julian Blackman who came into Utah as a corner was one of the best corners in the PAC 12 in 2017, then goes to safety and, Balls out, ends up being a third round draft pick to the Indianapolis Colts. So, I mean, there are a lot of fantastic players. And then obviously, as you pointed out, the units as a whole are very, very, um, very impressive as well. So, I mean, Morgan Scali has just done it all. I love the way that he uses the players in the secondary to blitz in like in crucial moments of the game. You think back to the USC game last year, one of the more underappreciated plays of that game. It was a third down, I believe, uh, early in the second half. And uh, Clark Phillips, the third, sacks uh, Caleb Williams to make it fourth and long, forces USC to punt. And then from there, Utah just kind of took the game over. So that was a really big moment. You look at players like Cole Bishop, the way that he shoots through the gap and just blows plays up. I mean, those are things that Morgan Scali emphasizes. And I love the way that he uses uh, safeties such as Cole Bishop and uh, makes makes his secondary players more versatile than other coaches would. It's a great point. Bishop was so effective in the box last season for Utah at different points overall. And just, you know, that ability to have a guy like Clark Phillips that he is part of recruiting, helping develop as well, which obviously Coach Shaw does a fantastic job in that area as well. And the ability to then kind of leave him on an island and do the other things. You mentioned the blitzes. That might be the number one thing that stands out to me when you're talking about what makes Scali such a special defensive coordinator. Um, I think back to the Pac-12 championship game, just the game plan he drew up to kind of try to slow down USC, I was really impressed with. I love the different fronts they were playing, whether it was three man, just you never knew where the blitzes were going to come from. I feel like that's something they really figured out in the second half against USC is trying to keep Caleb Williams guessing from where the pressure is going to come at. And he's a guy who's capable of making throws on the move as we saw a couple of times. But if you can get to him, just as any quarterback in general, it's the best way to try and slow him down. So I just think the different blitzes he uses and throws at the guys. And I I think he just does an outstanding job. Once again, to your point, just mixing, mixing it up and just keeping offensive guessing because there are so many great offensive minds in college 
football. And there's a lot of great defensive minds too, but you really just, you wouldn't, you're playing defense. You have to react to what an offense is doing. I think Scally does a great job preparing his guys to put them in the best position to react and have that success overall. Just a couple other uh, numbers for Scally that really stand out to me. Um, Utah has finished atop the conference in sacks and tackles for loss three times under Scally, most recently back to back in 21 22. The team also finished 2018 season ranked 11th nationally in sacks overall and in the pac 12 they were first in sacks overall utah finished in the top half of the pac 12 in total defense six times in the past eight seasons ranking second nationally and first in the league in 2019 over the past season scally's defense also held programs to 15 points or few or past four seasons scally's defense has held opponents to 15 points or fewer 24 times tied for ninth most by a power five program and one thing that on tomorrow's show, I'm going to have Michelle Bodkin on, and we are going to be discussing Andy Ludwig's offense uh, overall and where he ranks amongst the top offensive coordinators. We did see this Utah offense get to, get off to some slow starts last year, and that's something you got to give Scally a lot of credit for is they really n- almost never fell behind, or if they did, it was only by a score or something like that. This defense was very stingy overall in the season and was still, for my money, the most formidable in the pack. Yeah, most definitely. You look at a game like Washington State, very low scoring, very chippy mm-hmm. um, on a short week on the road as well. And Utah's offense was was pretty stagnant for the majority of that game. I know Jalen Dixon and Money Barks had a couple of big catches down the stretch there. But for the most part, the defense was what was keeping Utah in the game. And I think that just go, just uh, is credited to Morgan Scally's attention to detail week in and week out, just making sure that his players are going to bring their A game. And you look at a game like that with Trap written all over, coming off a huge win against USC. Players are a bit banged up on the road against a Washington State team that was very formidable. You know, they had a good defense. They made a bowl game. So, I mean, that was that was no slouch team. You know, they, they could have beat anyone at home um, on a short week, that's for sure. So, I mean, and it, Morgan Scali just having that um, – having that just attention to detail, like I said, going into each and every week and with a business-like approach. And then to your point, like as you were bringing up the Pac-12 championship game, it kind of made, it kind of reminded me about the uh, the halftime adjustments, the in-game adjustments that he made there uh, using Mo Diabate more on the edge and mm-hmm. uh, letting Gabriel drop back a little bit and kind of pick his spots uh, when it comes to which hole to shoot through, like, kind of letting the play develop and uh, more of a delayed blitz. But we saw that be very effective throughout that game multiple times. That entire second half, Caleb Williams was running for his life from that Utah front seven. So um, very good by Morgan Scali there as well after giving up a couple of touchdowns early. So, I mean, just a bunch of performances stick out. He's easily a top five defense coordinator in my mind. And I think he's rightfully earned um, earned uh, the title back of uh, coach and waiting. Yeah, definitely. It, I, I would agree so as well. I just think when you look at his ability and how his players, how much they love him, the current players and overall the ones he's coached, I believe I think he's earned that uh, back as well. Another just number that really impressed me was Scali's team last year. Uh, Utah allowed an average of 334 y- total yards per game overall last season, but that was still, it's it's college football team score. <laughs> team score a lot and move the ball a lot. So that's still 18th overall. And that's after you lose a guy in the front seven like a Devin Lloyd from the year before. And that is not an easy uh, player to lose, obviously, being as he was a first round pick. And I thought they navigated that very well with the way Diabate kind of adjusted over the season, Lander Barton's growth over the course of the season. I thought Scali did a good job putting his players in position to succeed overall. And it's one of the many reasons that he is one of the top, top defensive coordinators in the country. But is he top five? Is he top 10? Where exactly do we think he should fall? We're going to talk about that in a moment. But first, I want to talk to you guys about the sponsor of this episode in LinkedIn Talent Solutions. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn Jobs is super easy. Whether you're looking to get a job or you're trying to hire for your business, there's a lot of great candidates to find on LinkedIn Jobs, and it's really easy to create a free job post on LinkedIn Jobs. You just go over and create your post and then add the your job and the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. Then you can use simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experiences so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's one word, all caps, locked on college. Or that's once again linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions may apply all right dante coming back into this one when you're talking about where does morgan scally rank as a defensive coordinator i do look there's a lot of great defensive coordinators and i would have no i i think he belongs inside the top t- 10 i think he has to be i personally i'm gonna have him in the top five i'm with you i think he belongs in the top five but i i i think he should be in the top 10 
I'm not going to completely roll my eyes if I see him in the top 15 for some people, just because, look, there are a lot of good defensive coordinators. Once again, I feel like he, at the very least, should be top 10, but I can hear an argument for top 15. But anything outside of that, I feel like, is then just being a little disrespectful to what he's accomplished during his time at Utah overall. And I do feel like he belongs up there with the uh, the Phil Parkers at Iowa, who when you have that bad of an offense and you still get bull eligible, is <laughs> an incredible. Uh, the Jess Minters at Michigan, Jim Knowles at Ohio State, Jim Leonard at Wisconsin. I think when you're talking about those kind of four right there, I would put Morgan Scally as kind of the next one. And I know Manny Diaz has done a great job at Penn State, too. There's a lot of really good defensive coordinators in college football. It's funny when you talk about like the best offensive coordinators in college football. It's funny because I don't feel like then you're talking about the best offensive minds in college football because all the best offensive minds are pretty much head coaches. It's just harder for defensive coaches to have that success in terms of being a head coach they just don't get as many opportunities because everyone is looking for the innovative offensive mind now us at utah know how well it can work to have a stable defensive per person become your head coach with what the success that coach winningham has ascended to and as you mentioned more than likely going to be morgan scally as the new head coach and waiting here very shortly um but once again just in general i feel like that scally belongs in the top five that's where i would have him but i don't think it's crazy to put him in the top 10 and i can at least hear an argument for why he'd be top 15 but uh why do you feel like he's a top five defensive coordinator and do you feel like he belongs in the discussion with these names we just brought up Dante I most definitely think he belongs in the top five and for all the reasons that I stated beforehand the in-game adjustments the attention to detail week in and week out the great players that he's coached and developed over the years but also he's a master motivator you know the guy gets fired up for every single week and uh, the energy reflects onto his players and reflects mm -hmm. and that's reflected when you watch Utah football on TV you know these players bring the passion they love uh, their school they love playing for this team and I think that's a big testament to Morgan Scally. I think he's definitely a top five defense coordinator. But I do agree with you where, like, I could see somebody in the top – somebody ranking him in the top 15, and I wouldn't really bat, bat too much of an eye about that because um, not everyone gets to watch Utah football week in and mm -hmm. week out. You know, so, I mean, it just comes down to who's watching what, and some writers aren't watching Utah football as much as we are. Everyone that does watch Utah football like we do knows that Morgan Scally is a top five defensive coordinator. And in my mind, that's, that's all that really matters, you know, because um, he is. He most definitely is, and I think – he will be a fine coach after uh, after Coach Winningham retires. I mentioned a lot of the names that I kind of consider to be those other guys in the top five, Phil Parkers, the Mentors, the Knowles, the uh, Jim Leonard at Wisconsin still, uh, that group of guys. Who for you, who would you kind of put as your kind of other guys that you would put in the same category, I should say, tier as a um, – as I just blanked on it, actually, as a uh, scally. <laughs> I like Jim Knowles a lot. I thought he was fantastic at Oklahoma State. I thought that was one of the best coaching moves in recent history, honestly, when Ohio State brought him aboard. I think it's just going to take another year, give it a couple of years, and next thing you know, Ohio State's going to be clicking on all cylinders. That defense that a lot of people kind of marked as a question mark, a weakness maybe, is no longer going to be that, and they'll be a full-on powerhouse like they should be because – they got some ridiculous talents, and Jim Knowles is a great defensive mind, very similar to Morgan Scally, honestly, in the way that he uh, is able to um, bring the energy with his players and get his players fired up uh, for a big game, for just any game in general. So I like Jim Knowles a lot, Jim Leonard as well at Wisconsin, and obviously uh, Parker, like you said, from Iowa. Those are the teams that are, I kind of – even Oklahoma State when they had um, Jim Knowles, they, they were kind of in the teams that like I kind of grouped with Utah where it's like – you could kind of pencil them in for eight and four, nine and three, maybe. Um, but they'll kind of fall off towards the end of the year. But you know their defense is going to be electric. I feel like Utah's kind of taken a step up over those other teams over the past couple of years, winning a couple of conference championships and having an offense that's as uh, prolific as Utah ha Utah's has been ever since pretty much 2018 um, when it was Tyler Huntley, Zach Moss, Brent Covey, all those guys. So, I mean, pretty much the same guys that you were saying. Manny Diaz, I think you could throw him, but maybe it'll give him a little bit more time yeah. because last year was just his first year at Penn State, and you know how bad – um, Miami was when he was at the helm calling mm. the shots as the head coach. So maybe give it a couple more years, but I do think that Penn State team is going to be super electric this season. I love the new quarterback they got. The defense returns a ton of studs. So that's a team that is definitely um, a playoff contender. And if, if they can make the playoff, Manny Diaz has definitely solidified himself as a top five coordinator in college football. And then also, uh, I forgot his name, but the, the Iowa – or no, not Iowa, Illinois defensive coordinator – He's going to be a head coach very soon. If he's not already, he might have honestly gotten hired at some point in the offseason. I'm blanking on his name, but he, he's a stud, and he's going to find himself as a head coach very soon. Yeah, Brett Beal and his team was a lot of fun last season. They surprised a lot of people with how competitive they were. And uh, yeah, unfortunately, I'm not 100% sure on his name either. But as we said, there's a lot of – there are he's a lot of really good – He's going to be very good. Uh, yeah, there's I, a lot of really – yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of really good defensive minds in college football, and there's a lot of uh, different defensive coaches and all those kind of things that you can rank and have a good reason and justification for above. I'm not going to bring up the list because I don't want to call them out. I did find one list that had Alex Grinch above Morgan Scally. 
which I just found to be a little strange considering year in and year out, what are the Achilles heel of Oklahoma, of Lincoln Riley's Oklahoma and USC teams? It's been their defense. I think you could make an argument that last year Grinch might, that Riley should have might've even moved on from Grinch because of those struggles. And I understand, Hey, first year, maybe give him another year with his guys and figure it out. But that's where just, when you look at this Utah team, there has been like maybe parts of a defense. Let's say like one, like last year, we mentioned the linebackers had their struggles at points, but then by the end of the season, it kind of came around, came together. I just, I just think Morgan Scally is so well respected and what he's accomplished overall. His defense has never been the downfall of this Utah team really at any point, I feel like. So I just, I don't think it's fit. That's one for me. Like, I just don't see how there's an argument for an Alex Grinch to be over Morgan Scally for what Morgan Scally has accomplished year in and year out versus Grinch has consistently underperformed for what he's been asked to do at these big brands, I feel like. Yeah, I mean, that's just simply a ridiculous take. It's either clickbait or the person (laughs) writes for USC or they've never watched a game, a snap, a minute of Utah football. Um, I don't really feel the need to elaborate too much on that. Like I feel like <laughs> anyone that's watching Locked on Utes kind of knows that uh, Morgan Scali is 10 times the coordinator Alex Grinch is. And Alex Grinch and Lincoln Riley have worked together in the past as well at Oklahoma. He was their defense coordinator there as well. So, I mean, he's had, quote unquote, his guys pretty much the yes, entire time he's been point. with Lincoln Riley. And he, he's he's fumbled the bag every single season. And Yet Lincoln Riley still retains him for I, I can't say why. I'm not going to speculate on it either because um, I, I just genuinely don't know. But I, I do know that Morgan Scally is a lot is a much better defense coordinator than Alex Grinch. That's that's for sure. Yeah, he definitely Scally definitely belongs in this top five conversation. And I'm excited to see the season's going to have because it's Utah defense. Yes, they lost Clark Phillips, but man, they got a lot of talent on that side of the ball with everyone who's coming back and some of the talented transfers they brought in. So it's going to be fun to see how they do this coming season. And on tomorrow's show, we'll be joined by Michelle Bodkin to talk about where Andy Ludwig kind of ranks when it comes to offensive coordinators in college football. But before we go, Dante, I do want to talk about Utah men's basketball, who the first time in Craig Smith's three years with the team used all 13 of their roster spots. They brought in a Turkish forward. I believe the first name is Karan. I apologize if I uh, mispronounced that, and I'm not even going to attempt the last name because that's going to be even worse. So uh, either way, just a really talented forward for this team. He chose Utah over Wisconsin, Marquette, Wyoming, according to Ute Zone Steve Bartle. And when you're talking about this Turkish forward, too, he's 6'8". He's got a good feel for the game. Averaged 15, 6, and 3 overall. Played really well last season and really shined in the World Cup, too. And just when you talk about his game, elaborating on it a little bit more, I just feel like he's got a good feel for the game. Uh, not to be like the stereo, like Euro, Euro player type of things, but I do feel like just his knowledge in general. I feel like I, when I watch him, he makes the right pass. He makes the right play. He's also a good shooter, too. And he does a good job knocking down shots consistently from the outside. May struggle to guard the top athletes, but I don't feel like he'll go out there and teams are going to be like targeting him and just picking and trying to take advantage of him out there too. And uh, I do think he's, as I mentioned, smart player finishes pretty good around the rim too. So I just think these are the kind of guys I want on the court because they make my team better because you don't watch him play and you're not like, Oh, that that's a bad shot. He doesn't take those. He always makes the extra pass to find his open teammate and things like that is, is more than willing to feed it into Brandon Carlson down low rather than take a tough shot. I don't know if he's going to be able to play this year, but uh, I like guys like this who've been able to like shine on stages. As I mentioned, like a world cup stage, I think he's a guy who will have a chance to play this coming season so i think this is a really good final roster spot addition and i think when you have a chance to get a player like this this is why you do use that final roster spot that utah hasn't used in the past dante this move i think really benefits the structure of the offense in general mainly because you look at last season the big issue was shooting you know utah ranked in the 200s or the 300s in just about every shooting category the shooting was very bad adding a player Um, like this, who's going to make that extra pass, who's going to add some stability to the offense and has experience on a World Cup stage is going to be big. I I think that he is going to raise those percentages. I think Utah's percentages in general for shooting are going to go up a good amount this season with the additions of a player like Cole Bajma, who was um, a player at Michigan who averaged 10 points at uh, Washington. I mean, there's some some solid players coming in. Uh, Lawson Lovering as well, who might not be more of an offensive guy, a bit more of a defensive guy, but that's a former top 100 recruit right there. So a couple of good players coming in and uh, adding another one and filling the roster spots is, is pretty big. And uh, I like these European players because a lot of them kind of fly under the radar and you don't really know what you're going to get. And um, I mean, the upside is definitely there. You have a player with World Cup um, experience. That's a lot more experience than the vast majority of college basketball players. So having a leg up in that department is definitely not going to hurt your team. And like you said, it's definitely great to see Utah um, using a final roster spot for the first time in Smith's tenure. 
Yeah, especially just like we mentioned with a player with this much experience and the chance to be a difference maker. So it's going to be interesting to see how the running youths perform when they get back in action uh, in November. And we're, we're, of course, Dante still counting down the days till football season gets going. But thankfully, we're just two days away at the time that uh, this will release from Pac-12 Media Day. And with that, Coach Witt is going to be asked about the health of Cam Rising and Brant Keithy. Now, what I want to know, Dante, and we're going to do I we're going to do this on tomorrow's show with uh, Michelle as well. So I'll give my prediction for how it's going to unfold. But I want to play a little game. When Coach Witt is asked the question, how will how healthy are Cam and Brant? What do you think his answer will be? Going to be something like really vague. I don't I don't know exactly what's going to be along the lines of like they're as healthy as you want them to be. Something along those lines, something of that sort. Witt is not going to reveal too much. Uh, mm-hmm. That's one thing I do know, and he's going to try his best. To, to keep it all in um, just depends on how many reporters asking that question and how much they uh, can milk out information from him because most of the time there's not a whole lot to be milked from him because he is, he is stone cold. <laughs> His health could be cam rising and brand's health could be the second most asked question at PAC 12 media day in general, but by far the first will be for commissioner Klyakov. What is going on with the PAC 12 media rights deal? That is going to be one. I know he's prepared to dodge that question because he's going to be getting it a lot. I think he knows what he's going to do when uh, he goes up on the stage and uh, discusses all that, but it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out come media day this Friday. Dante, we appreciate you joining us and just in preparation for the college football season. What are some of the stuff you've been working on? So I'm just pretty much covering all the teams in Power Five, um, going from west to east coast. So I'm doing Pac-12 or finish finished up Pac-12, and now we're moving on to Big 12. And then from there, it's just going to be like one per day. Honestly, mine have been like very like spotty. Some days I'll forget, so I'll just drop like a ton in one day. But by the by the first day of college football season, there will be 69 articles published, wow. recovering each team and a record prediction. Sometimes bets as well. If there's a team that I think is severely undervalued, overvalued, et cetera. Um, there's a couple out right now. I know Oregon, there's a bet for that one. And Cal, I think there's one for that one as well. So, I mean, there's definitely definitely some good information out there. If you want to learn more about just some players in general in the Pac-12 conference and college football in general, um, go check them out. It's my Twitter uh, link linked right there. A uh, bunch, bunch of stuff out on my page. So just, yeah, have at it. Yeah, make sure you guys check all that great stuff out at Dante Guardi on Twitter. And Dante, we appreciate you for joining us. That is going to do it for today's edition of Locked On Utes. But as I mentioned, rejoin us again tomorrow as Michelle Bodkin of KSL Sports will be joining us to talk about where Andy Ludwig ranks amongst the elite offensive coordinators in college football. We'll see you then. Have a great day.